Hi, my name is Félix Vivier, and this is Introduction to Game Animation, a Painless Strategy to Survival. I'm a French animator working at Supercell in Helsinki, Finland. I have grown up in South and North America before moving back to France, where I studied 3D CG and animation, as well as history of arts and cinema. I previously worked at Pretty Simple in Paris as a freelancer in Madrid, as well as uh, an animator at Axis Studio in Glasgow, Scotland. And now I work at Supercell, where I take care of animations in the Brawl Stars team. <laughs> so, what is Brawl Stars? Well, Brawl Stars is a free-to-play hero-based, fast-paced multiplayer game where you group up with friends and face off against other players in a variety of mayhem-induced game modes such as Gem Grab, Brawl Ball, or Showdown. The first thing I want to clarify is this is not meant to be an animation tutorial, nor a breakdown of a specific character animation I did or a shot I did. I will not teach you to animate, but um, rather I want to demonstrate a system or a way of thinking that has helped me get better at animation, get faster at animation, and reduce the amount of headaches I experience when I sit down in Maya and start to animate. The topics that I want to talk about include my personal philosophy uh, towards animation, also my own methodology that I use uh, every time I animate something, and uh, also I want to just get quickly into how to infuse personality into your animation cycles. Okay, let's dive right into the meat of the subject, uh, my own personal philosophy. So what would be a talk about animation if uh, I didn't cover the 12 principles of animation, right? For those of you that don't know, um, these are a set of rules or principles developed by Disney veteran animators in the middle of the 20th century in a quest to perfect the craft of animation. They are largely regarded as the most important concepts to learn for any animator. The 12 principles include terms like squash and stretch, anticipation, straight ahead and pose to pose, staging, follow through and overlapping action, slow in and slow out, arcs, secondary action, timing, appeal, and exaggeration. If you've never heard of those terms before, I highly recommend that you look these up. This is going to be slightly controversial though, because I think these are a little confusing as they are currently spelled out. Animators and other artists in the industry love to name drop terms like squash and stretch or overlap, follow through. And sure, we all understand what these mean, but the over-reliance of animators on these terms uh, especially in school by teachers, uh, limit our capacity to understand animation in different concepts and uh, terms uh, that sometimes can be more relatable. Animation is a limitless medium, only bound by our brain's capacity to imagine, really. In that sense, um, relying on a set of principles that sometimes uh, feel uh, a lot like rules that um, you have to obey. I think it's just pulling a ceiling cap on creativity. Yes, the nine old men were geniuses, but we have to understand that we sit on the shoulder of giants. Giants that were um, honestly biased to a specific form of animation, the Disney animation. So in an attempt to uh, figure out a solution that would work better for me, uh, I came up with the principles of kinetic energy. And I know what you're thinking right now. All right, Felix, you said you were gonna teach us a system uh, to animate uh, less painfully. And right now, physics sound even more complicated than animation. I don't wanna learn that. Well, bear with me for a second, hear me out. Thinking about animation in physical terms has a few advantages. First, physics relates to about everything in life, and it, that is also true for animation. So much of our work as animators is about figuring out how things move. The laws of physics are an attempt at describing just those phenomena. Learning about those laws will make your life easier as an animator, as you will have a better 
frame of reference um, for any kind of animation that you attempt to reproduce in your cycles or in your shots. The truth is that all of us already experience kinetic energy on a daily basis. We simply need to educate ourselves better about uh, these phenomenons and how they interact each other and their effect on character animation. It isn't that I outright reject the 12 principles, but I personally think that they have become quite abstract rules that are taught and um, repeated without truly understanding the physical and historical context in which they are based on. And like any rule, they're meant to be broken. I also rarely find myself thinking about the 12 principles when I animate. It's quite difficult for me to remember them. They don't come to me as naturally as I would like to. So uh, for that reason, I had to find a solution that I could integrate more fluently and naturally so that when I animate, I'm constantly evaluating uh, what I'm doing and what I see um, on a concept that I can grasp very easily. I just think it would be really awkward for me to have a checklist with the 12 principle and every time I animate, I just, uh, you know, check, um, I try to check every little box and um, once I've tr checked 12 boxes, I'm done with my shot. It's, it's just not the way people animate, uh, not me and not others. What I know is that uh, I'm pretty sure many of you will think it's quite arrogant to go against the nine old men, but for me, it's quite important to question tradition and principles to better understand them and to find other systems that might work better for me. I really believe that understanding the laws of physics is not a way to replace the 12 principles, but a way to better understand them and become a better animator. So here are some of the terms that I uh, have integrated into my animation process. The first one is quite simply energy. I pretty much describe um, <laughs> animation as energy. It's just that simple. Like if you think energy as the intensity of a character or the intensity of a movement, um, things uh, become quite easy to grasp and it's uh, a very universal concept. Um, sure, you can try to define it in the proper scientific term and uh, if you want to hear it, it's um, um, so energy is a measurable property of any uh, object's capacity for doing work to heat up or to move. It can be stored, but um, uh, it cannot be created or destroyed, only converted or transferred. That means that in order for an object to move, it needs to be uh, transmitted energy by another object. So things never move on their own. There always need to be uh, energy stored somewhere. Um, this is why humans can move because we eat food and convert that food into energy that we can then use to move uh, our muscle or power or organs. But a piece of rock or um, <laughs> a bottle uh, cannot move because it doesn't have any intrinsic uh, energy unless uh, you make it alive and that is what animation does. Okay, the second concept that I think about often is force. You can uh, think about force as any interaction that change the motion of an object. So if someone is pulling or pushing something and um, one of the force that impacts the most our work as animator is uh, gravity, quite simply. It is a force that is always acting and everything we do, we have to consider um, the power of gravity. Um, another term that is um, quite important for any animator out there is, the, is weight. And uh, conveying the feeling of weight is something that is quite hard to do in animation. But if you dig a little deeper into what weight is all about, it all can become um, easier to uh, add weight to your animation. Weight, as not to be confused with mass, is um, the force exerted on any object by gravity. For example, 
if I'm uh, pu uh, pushing weights, um, the weight comes from the gravity. It's not that the weight has an intrinsic force that is pulling it downwards, it's that gravity is affecting that object. And the more mass an object has, the more weight it has. Um, but if you're animating things in space, for example, uh, suddenly uh, you're removing gravity out of the equation and then uh, things don't have weight anymore, but they still have mass. This is where things get slightly complicated. Um, momentum is a tricky but very useful concept to understand. I think it's very beneficial to uh, your animation if you can implement that concept. Um, but um, obviously, uh, I don't think that you need to have a very developed or advanced knowledge uh, about momentum and the law of uh, conservation of momentum. So momentum is um, mass multiplied by velocity. It's a force with a magnitude and a direction. And what that means is that um, the more mass a moving object has, the more uh, or the faster it moves, the more force it has. Basically, um, momentum is the force with which an object is moving. If you think of a bowling ball, it has a large mass. So even if it's not moving that fast, it will have a lot of strength. And the same way that as a baseball uh, has a very small mass, it still can have a lot of force if it's thrown uh, very fast. So if you're looking at this uh, uh, gun firing GIF, uh, what you're observing um, is actually uh, the law of conservation of momentum. And basically that law uh, states that um, in a closed system, so in a system where you only have the gun and the bullet, if the gun is stationary, if it's not moving, it has a momentum of zero. It's basically the mass of the gun, which is, it doesn't really matter, and the velocity. If the velocity is zero, uh, which it is when it's not moving, then you're multiplying the mass, which can be, let's say, it's uh, five kilograms, by zero, which means uh, momentum equals zero. The law of conservation of momentum states that uh, in a closed system, the amount of momentum before and after an event always has to be the same. So when you're fired a gun, the velocity and momentum in one specific direction, and because of that momentum gained, the gun has to actually compensate to keep the momentum equal to zero. So it's moving in the opposite direction. So you have a positive velocity and a negative velocity. And that is why, um, <laughs> that is what recoil is all about. It's about conservation of momentum. The last concept that I wanna talk about is inertia. And this one is uh, just a little bit uh, easier to understand. Inertia is the resistance uh, of any object to a change in its velocity. If an object is not moving, it will never move until another force makes it move. And it's the same way that if an object is moving, uh, until there is another opposing forces, basically it means that without any force applied to it, a stationary object uh, will stay stationary forever. And uh, without any opposing force applied to it, a moving object will move forever. Um, and it will move forever in the same direction. Think about uh, if you would uh, throw a ball so uh, fast that you would throw it into space. Once uh, the ball is in space and until there is the gravity of any other uh, planet or any star or even a black hole, the ball will move in the same direction until it encounters another force pulling it into another direction. But on Earth, um, the effect of inertia is often hidden um, by gravity or hair resistance or friction uh, causing uh, an object to eventually slow down to a rest. Not all objects have the same amount of inertia. The higher the mass of an object, the higher its inertia or resistance to change in velocity is.
if you look at the crash test GIF, um, the car suddenly uh, comes to a stop. So its momentum suddenly comes to zero. Uh, it has a collision with the wall and obviously the wall has uh, such a big mass that it, it just stops almost instantly the momentum of the car. But because there are objects um, in the car, they continue their course um, until they are stopped as well. And this is the uh, best example of inertia that I could find. So to tie this chapter up and uh, also demonstrate that this philosophy is not complete gibberish uh, that has no real uh, concrete use in animation, here's how these laws relate to a very familiar exercise, the balancing ball. Okay, so if you take a look at the balancing ball image, the ball um, starts its course as a stationary object in mid-air. But due to inertia, the ball wants to stay stationary. But uh, because of the force of gravity, um, the ball slowly accelerates downward. As it travels down, the ball gains more momentum, more energy. So as it hits the ground, uh, the ball's momentum keep uh, pushing and compressing the ball forward acting like a spring. Uh, some of that energy gets converted into heat and sound, but the rest of the energy springs the ball back up and causes the ball to accelerate upwards. However, uh, since gravity and air resistance are acting as opposing forces uh, to that upward movement, the ball quickly loses velocity and reverses uh, its uh, downward course. So the same effects keep acting on the ball until it eventually runs out of energy. I don't think it's necessary to learn the laws of physics by heart, but spending something like uh, an afternoon learning the basic physics concept will give you a good understanding of how objects and people interact with the real world and will be extremely helpful um, when trying to figure out complex animations of your characters. Okay, so let's end this chapter with a totally real quote by Albert Einstein. Es ist Physik, Bruder. Here's another subject I want to touch on. Music and animation have a lot in common. And when I mean a lot, I mean it's basically the same thing. In their purest form, both music and animation can be appreciated by anyone of any age, of any culture or language that you speak. They both utilize rhythm and tempo to create an emotional reaction in our brains. A lot of it has to do with repetition and how this plays with uh, the audience's expectation. We can borrow a lot from uh, the principles of music um, by using rhythm, tempo, and accents to create visually interesting animations. Look at that gif of Bugs Bunny uh, playing the piano. Besides being a totally goofy and such a unique and visually interesting way uh, to perform an action like playing the piano, so much of what makes it sing is really that contrast between those uh, three big jumps uh, and let's call it the finger walk. We can totally hear the music he's playing just by looking at the animation. This is what every animation should strive for. Okay, so here's a another totally real um, code by another famous German. Es ist visuelle Musik. The last concept that I want to uh, talk about in this uh, philosophy chapter um, are the specifics of game animation. Game animation has this extra design layer that uh, separates itself from its more narratively focused uh, cousin animation with a big A, if you will. In video games, animation serve a very specific purpose uh, depending on the type of game and depending on uh, the characters. Are you animating for a player character? Are you animating for a non-playable character? Are you animating VFX? Are you animating UI? There's uh, a lot of different types of animation in games. There are three different uh, concepts uh, when animating for games that I think are important to remember. The first one is responsiveness. 
when the player inputs a control, you generally want the action to happen uh, almost immediately or at least as fast as possible. Responsiveness is important because it makes the player feel in control and able to react to what is happening in game. The second concept is feedback. Every time something relevant happens in game, uh, that information needs to be displayed to the player. And more often than not, that information is displayed as animation. Think about every time you hit or get hit in a fighting game. You need to be able to know you have uh, dealt or have taken damage. That information is usually displayed as a mix of animation, VFX, and UI. Feedback is extremely important to be able to react correctly to any action uh, during gameplay. The third and last concept is uh, clarity. Clarity simply means that animation needs to convey information to the player with as little noise as possible to limit confusion. There is no one way to approach game animation as there are as many approaches as there are types of games. 2D pixel art games will generally have more limited animation where exaggeration and clarity is key to provide the player with enough feedback. Whereas more naturalistic AAA games will be much more focused on uh, realistic animation to create immersion and sometimes more willing to compromise um, responsiveness uh, to give the player a feeling of weight and believability. One thing that will never change though is that game animation is heavily driven by design principles. Game animation, like any good design, uh, should be at the service of the user. Functionality first, aesthetic second. I happen to have run out of a uh, famous German to quote, um, so can move on uh, to the next chapter, which is um, my methodology and uh, where I try to break down my uh, process of how I animate in Maya. So the first thing I do every time I open Maya is test out the rig. Basically, this is where you open the rig for the first time, you're starting a new animation, maybe you're using a new rig. So in that sense, before animating straight away like a knucklehead, familiarize yourself uh, with the rig. Sometimes uh, features can be hidden inside attributes, inside controllers. Uh, that is especially true for some of the most complex rigs out there. Um, so before you animate uh, using a controller because you thought uh, that um, some feature that you wish you could use uh, uh, wasn't available where it was just slightly hidden, and now you have to reanimate everything, um, it's good to just uh, try to figure out everything the rig has to offer. Move every controller. Um, try out poses just so you can see the range of the rig. Um, this is a perfect time to uh, find out bugs and report them as well as uh, request new features. Make sure that before you start animating, you have a solid grasp of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, you might have uh, a good idea of uh, what you're going to be animating. Uh, maybe it's um, a baseball swing or maybe it's a run cycle. Um, but no matter what, it's really hard to animate from your head. So make sure that you use references. Um, never assume how the body works and um, study body mechanics. Uh, if you want to animate someone running, uh, make sure that you understand um, the physical principles of uh, running. Understand where the power comes from, what is leading, uh, what part of the body are you used for balance, um, all that stuff. Uh, get inspiration from uh, multiple ideas and multiple sources. Just want you to take a look at this uh, painting. It's uh, called Las Meninas by Diego Velázquez. Now take a look of this painting. It is also called Las Meninas, but by Pablo Picasso. And take a look at this one as well, and this one as well. 
If Pablo Picasso uses references, and not only uses references, but used the same reference on 58 different paintings throughout uh, the time of two months, you should use references. I'm slightly getting sidetracked here, but um, just want to show this quote from um, Picasso when he was asked why did he paint uh, 58 times from the same uh, reference. He said, I never do painting like a work of art. It is always a search. It is, I'm always seeking and there is a logical connection throughout the search. This is why I numbered him. I number and date him. Maybe one day someone will thank me for it. Well, just wanna say thank you, Picasso. You can find references pretty much anywhere. It doesn't matter where it comes from, as long as it inspires you and that it helps you animate. If you're trying to animate a walk cycle, first thing you should do is type in Google run cycle reference. There's a bunch of different resources. Some are good, some are bad, but it is up to you to kind of filter out um, all of the content and figure out um, what is helpful to you. But the best idea is to cross-reference all of these uh, different um, guides so that you are not taking only from one single source, but you're using multiple sources instead. Um, so this is what uh, you can find on Google. You can also find a lot of um, uh, animation reference um, on Pinterest, for example, this is what shows up when you type run reference on Pinterest. You have a lot of posing references, but also a lot of uh, run uh, cycle breakdowns. Also, take a look at YouTube. Um, there's a lot of um, great uh, videos of real people uh, walking and running from all different kind of angles. I think it's really important to uh, go down to the source sometimes when you're trying to animate someone walking or running. Uh, because a lot of those um, wild cycle references that you can find on Google are people that looked at references of real people and already translated, already made um, creative choices on uh, how to simplify a run cycle. So sometimes if you really want to go to the essence of a run, uh, it's good to look at real people. Uh, you can also look at movies. Um, there's any kind of movie that you know you find an action that is interesting, save it, save that clip, uh, put it in your library of references and use it anytime uh, you think that is an opportune moment. Okay, so once you have gathered your references, um, it's time to start building the first pose. Personally, I like to block my animation in step mode. That means uh, that I remove the computer generated interpolation between uh, the keys so that I can focus on the posing and on the timing without having any other kind of distraction. I don't want to look poses that I haven't controlled myself. So for example, when I animate a run cycle, I'm always starting from the contact pose. But uh, if I'm animating, for example, a win animation uh, for Brawl Stars, I often start with the last pose because the last pose is going to be an idol that is going to play in a loop. So I want to make sure that um, I already know the ending of my animation so that what I animate translates into that last pose. I think the first pose or the contact pose um, in a run cycle is the most important part of the animation. And I think it's also the most overlooked. Posing in general is the most important task. You can have the best timing in the world, but if your poses are unclear, um, it's just going to be a confusing mess. So make sure that you take the time to pose your character and that you push that pose uh, as much as possible. It's always good to push it too far and then um, back down than it is to have a pose that is not pushed enough and then move on with animating other poses and then having to modify your whole animation uh, because of that simple mistake. Every other pose 
at least in a run cycle, water falls down from that first contact pose. If you get the contact pose right, you have done 50% of the work. So once you're done with that first pose, uh, it's time to move on to add all the following key poses. Key poses are all the extreme in uh, an action. There are generally the contact pose, the hit pose, any change of direction. Think of it as, you know, uh, every time your character extend and compresses, uh, think of it as squash and stretch, if you will. The key poses, uh, as their name suggests, are the most essential poses uh, for your audience to be able to understand the action that you're animating. Without which, it would be just impossible to understand what is going on. If you think of a baseball player um, swinging the bat to hit the ball, the key poses are, you know, when he twists his torso and springs the bat behind his head. This is where he is the most compressed. And then he swings the bat and hits the ball. This is where the arms will be the most extended. And after that, the bat follows through around his body um, thanks to conservation of uh, momentum. And this is uh, the body compressing again. So these three moments in time are considered the key poses. Okay, so once you have all of your key poses, you can move on to the breakdowns. Breakdowns are the most important step to break up the linearity between two extremes and make the motion more interesting. Think about breakdowns as uh, trying to answer the question, how does this move from A to B? It is a step that is most important to break up the linearity between two extremes and make the motion more interesting. So if you take a look at point A and point B, where do you put point C? And this is the question you're uh, trying to answer when you are uh, in the process of adding breakdowns. You could add uh, point C just here, right in the middle uh, on the line between A and B, or you could uh, shift C slightly towards A or slightly towards B, or you could put it just below B, or you could put it above and close to A. There is just no right answer on where you put the breakdown. Uh, it, it all depends on what you're trying to achieve and it all depends on the style of animation you're doing. If you're doing something more realistic, then your breakdowns are going to try to mimic uh, a more naturalistic way of movement. And uh, generally it's a little bit more smooth uh, and subtle. But uh, if you're doing stylized animation, then this is where you can exaggerate a lot, not only in terms of uh, spacing, but uh, timing as well. Usually adding breakdowns is uh, also a way to uh, try to determine what is leading and what is following. So in the case of baseball, if you look at that GIF, you can see that the hips are initiating the swing. The hips are leading the motion. This is where the power comes from. And that power gets transmitted upwards to the chest. And then that power gets transmitted to the arms and then to the bat. It's like a spring uncoiling from the bottoms up. So adding breakdowns mean that between point A and point B, you're designing which uh, part of the body is moving first. So once you're done with your breakdowns, um, it's usually time to spline your curves. That means uh, converting your keys from step mode to spline. You need to have a really good mythology in the step um, because um, it can be a very messy and terrifying process uh, if you don't really know what you're doing. And um, it, it is just uh, such a, a demoralizing feeling to hit that spine button and just see your animation, which had a nice timing being transformed into this spaghetti mess. Uh, you can have rotation issues, you can have gimbal lock issues, 
things can start to feel floaty. And all of that is because the computer is assuming uh, a lot of information or a lot of data on uh, how those um, things are moving from point A to point B. So it's not between the keys, but it's between, uh, between the key poses, but between every key. So if you have uh, every key posed in your animation, you won't have uh, any uh, interpolation issues. But um, if you're leaving, you know, two, three, four, five frames between each uh, keys, then the you're leaving room for the computer to uh, create a mess. Demonstrating how I would solve all of the issues that can happen when you transition from step to spline uh, would be, I think, out of the scope of this talk. It really needs its own um, video. The key to navigate uh, splines without getting lost is to focus on cleaning up each control, uh, starting from the center of gravity, and then moving on to the legs, and then moving up the spine and into the head and the arms. Um, what you want to focus uh, on the center of gravity first is because this is where uh, the power of your animation comes from. This is where all the force is being initiated. So you want to have a, uh, your center of gravity, which is usually the hips, uh, feeling grounded and having believable weight before you start cleaning up any of the other um, uh, controls. So if you follow this system, you should be able to end up with your splines and your animation looking like this. Okay, once you have beautiful splines, it's now uh, time to uh, polish your animation. Uh, this is the final step where you take care of all the little details that still need to be addressed to push your animation towards 100% completion. Um, you should have fixed every major issue that you have with your animation regarding posing, timing, uh, any kind of issue before moving on to polish. This is where you add secondary motion like cape and hair uh, or anything that dangles and jingles. Tighten up your spacing and uh, smooth out those arcs. After all this, you should now be done with your animation. Congratulations. Although everyone knows that animation is never done. So this is the moment where I want to touch upon uh, the tricks that I use to make sure that I add personality into my animations. First little trick, I want to go back to uh, one of my uh, previous point, which is that the first key pose dictates everything. It's 50% of the work. If that pose isn't right, if it isn't pushed enough, it will be very hard to get the rest of your animation looking good. And that is especially true for run cycles. The contact pose is where everything happens uh, personality-wise. This is where you make all the decisions of who is that character uh, how does he run? And why is he running? This is where you can add all of those little characterizations that are going to make your run feel unique. Take a look at the two different poses right there. The one on the left is a generic run animation pose. There is nothing really special to it. And the one on the right, it is subtle, but it is pushed slightly more. There is more lean onto the body onto the run. The head is also uh, rotated a little bit downwards as to show some kind of intensity. I also make sure that her arms are slightly exaggerated as to communicate a little bit more intensity on the run. The bandana as well is posed um, to make it look like it's floating in the wind or something. Okay, now take a look at this little animation that I prepared. Um, one way to describe it would be that it's certainly functional, but it's also quite monotone and linear and maybe even stiff, I would say. 
And if you look now at this second animation that I also prepared, it somehow conveys more emotion. It's more energetic, it's bouncy, it's organic. The main difference between this animation and the previous one is that I focused a lot on adding rhythm, adding some kind of interesting pattern, some kind of contrast, making sure everything is not moving the same uh, like a robot. I'm also breaking that rhythm. Uh, if you look at the hand, it's acting like a whip. And that whip aspect is uh, some kind of visual anchor that you notice and that plays a rhythm in your head. The torso and the head are also offset and moving up and down as a way to emphasize the up and down rhythm of the hips. I also added secondary motion in the hair and in the bandana just to further emphasize uh, the rhythm of the animation. But the most important thing that I changed is adding more frames into the air time of the run. So the moment where the character is airborne. I've added maybe something like five frames just to emphasize the bounciness aspect of the character. And all of that without changing the speed. So both animations are running at the same speed, but one of them is just staying in the air longer. And that is adding more emphasis on the bounce aspect. And that bounce is the rhythm of the animation. This is where the musicality comes from. So this is what I like to do. I like to add musicality and rhythm into animations anywhere I can. The same way a film score gives distinct musical patterns uh, to different characters. Darth Vader or Indiana Jones can solely be identified by their respective melodies. And you can use the same idea in your animations to make some character feel more unique. If you plan your animations in terms of beats, you can achieve characterization by giving specific rhythms to specific characters. This goes back to my previous point about different ways you can think about animations and how animation is quite literally visual music. Instead of thinking what emotion I want to animate, I'm thinking about how can I translate that emotion into a rhythm and then that rhythm into an animation. And what that does for me is that it breaks down and simplifies the process of adding personality into my characters. First, learn concepts behind and beyond the 12 principles of animation. Second, remember that animation is music. Aim to create feeling and emotion through rhythm. Third, gameplay is king. You need to respect the inherent constraints of the medium. Four, create a systemic approach with concrete steps and do not deviate from these steps. And fifth, character animation is motivation-based action. Movement for the sake of movement is meaningless. Give your characters a soul by adding personality and emotion to your animations. And that's it. This talk is over. Thanks a lot for your time and hopefully this has been helpful to some of you. If you have any questions, please send them my way and I'll try to answer them in a separate uh, Q&A video. If you're a student or an animator or you just want to reach out, I'm on social media, on Twitter at Felsevin and Instagram at FelixAnimates. Sorry for the bad German impressions and bye.